Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you are in New York City or the East Coast of the United States, good morning if you happen to be in sunny, warm Southern California, good evening if you happen to be in Europe, good overnight if you are somewhere else further east, hello in Africa and South America. I'm Fred Plotkin. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. Those of you who are regular visitors know that I like to invite people on the show who are inspiring to me. And in some cases, there are people I don't know at all. In some cases, there are people I know slightly. In other cases, such as today's guest, they are longtime close friends. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to pretend that Bob Spitz is new to me. Bob Spitz is not new to me, but he's terrific and a leader, someone whose torch I follow. He does a lot of superb work. He is musical, to be certain, but he has a very special gift. He has many, but one of them is... He is a definitive biographer of musicians. And we're going to talk to Bob about some of the people he's written about. They're not so much in the opera world and in the classical music world as in rock and pop music. But nonetheless, he writes about big figures and he writes about them better than just about anyone else I know. So, Bob, welcome and greetings to you in Los Angeles. Fred, it's always happy to see you and to uh, to chat with you. So I'm going to name a few of your books. I, I looked them up. The Making of Superstars, Artists and Executives in, in the Rock Music Business, Barefoot in Babylon about Woodstock, Dylan about Bob Dylan, a biography, The Beatles, Yeah, 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 which I imagine is a young adult version of uh, The Beatles, um, my personal favorite, The Saucier's Apprentice, uh, Deary, which I have right here. I have my copy, The Remarkable Life of Julia Child, Reagan, An American Journey about Ronald Reagan, and Led Zeppelin, The Biography. I just want to tell listeners who are not in the United States that Julia Child was, well, instead of me, Bob, you tell us who Julia Child was. Well, Julia Child is the uh, the godmother of cooking in the United States. She brought fine dining to uh, to America and taught people here not just how to um, to cook and eat, but how to live. She transformed all of our lives, and uh, and 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 the way we we kind of uh, operate in the United States. She transformed our supermarkets. She built the wine industry, um, a remarkable woman. And uh, the good news is that that book uh, has been made into a documentary uh, that is now playing in the States in theaters. And it was just long listed for an Academy Award. So we've got our fingers crossed oh. that uh, come uh, nomination time, it will make the shortlist as well. So you and I knew her, you dealt with her a lot. You and I, and she traveled together in Sicily, which was a memorable occasion for all of us, probably less so her than it was for you or me. Right. But um, there was something, I mean, when we think of sort of the great American personalities, neither male nor female, but just great American figures, she is right up there. And so it's not just about, eating and dining and everything that everybody fashionably does nowadays and tries to do and the latest trend. But she really was more of a revolutionary. Completely. And, and I, I rank her up there, Fred, with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Rosa Parks as the most important women of the 20th century. Uh, I really feel that she, she deserves her place in that pantheon and um, and people should discover her in that respect and, and see how she transformed American life. In your description, every, I think you left one thing out, television. 
Absolutely. I she think was, she radically changed American television. Would you talk about that? Yeah, actually, people don't realize this, but she she launched P, what we know as PBS, the public, the public broadcasting system in the United States. Before then, it was on a very strange ultra high frequency dial, and they only showed things like uh, you know, professors uh, talking about their classes, or uh, perhaps a symphony orchestra with no um, no person hosting it. Just this is what is going on at the time. But that that uh, national television sent out a tape of Julia Child, and soon people were playing it. Stations were playing it all over America. And out of those tapes, Julia Child launched what we now know as the PBS network. So she's remarkable in that respect as well. And you were originally from the Eastern part of the United States, but you are currently living in Los Angeles with your wonderful wife, who I of course know and adore. Uh, Julia grew up not far from there. We think of her, at least I thought of her as very much Northeastern New England, but she's actually from Southern California. Yeah, she's from Pasadena, which is just a few miles from uh, where I am now. And uh, she grew up, you know, with a silver spoon in her mouth. She came from a very, uh, a, a very prosperous family. She rebelled against it, uh, joined uh, the OSS, what is now, we now know as the CIA, mm -hmm. uh, during World War II and was stationed in Southeast Asia, where... You know, people say, was Julia a spy? Uh, I'm not so sure if Julia was doing the spy work herself, but she knew what was going on. She was, she worked for, she was the right-hand person of the head of the OSS. So uh, yeah, she she led a, a, a wonderful life and it's all there in that book and hopefully on the screen as well. What I find interesting among many things about her is that, yes, she was from Pasadena, from Southern California, California being a state with a remarkable bounty of food of all types. But when she was growing up, it was, quote, not fancy food. It was not California cuisine, but it would be beautiful oranges, gorgeous plums. The basics of the table were all there. Plus, California had meat, certainly, but also a remarkable coastline. Um, right. Eggs tasted like eggs; they were fresh. I th she was born in 1912, I think, and therefore, a lot of the food that she grew up with was very real, beautiful ingredients. The way Europeans, say in Italy or France, may have grown up having access to this kind of ingredient, and I think that plus her experience traveling in places, China, Norway, France, for a great deal of time, uh, shaped her cooking and her outlook. But would you say, Bob, that she was ultimately, even though her books were the French chef and a lot of French oriented food, that she was profoundly American? Oh, profoundly American. Absolutely. She was, uh, and she took great pride in it. But I, I just wanted to kind of address what you were just saying. You know, Julia lived in the midst of orange groves and lemon groves. Um, in fact, she lived right off of something called uh, Orange Grove Avenue. But in fact, J Julia never saw fresh, fresh vegetables or fresh fruit uh, mm -hmm. her entire time growing up. Her mother cooked out of cans. Uh, she, her vegetables came from, you know, green giant cans. And um, it wasn't until she got to, uh, to France that her... Uh, her palate was completely transformed. And then she realized that it was all coming from where she, near where she grew up. So uh, that's the irony in Julia's, uh, Julia's gastronomy. Any idea if Julia liked any kind of music, whether classical or rock and roll or? No, she loved classical music. Um, and she was a, uh, a great contributor to the Boston Symphony. Uh, the Bo and the Boston Pops. So uh, I know that she was very involved uh, in the classical field. I wonder if anyone ever thought to ask her to do one of the onstage narrations. She was such uh -huh. an iconic American, such as Aaron Copeland's Lincoln Portrait or 
Peter and the Wolf by Prokofiev, yeah. she would have been, she had, we'll talk about her voice because we Americans, the first thing we think of with Julia Child is actually her voice. Yes, her family called it hooting uh, because her voice rose and, and, and fell in register uh, when she talked. And, and it, it was just, uh, people always assumed that she was from the UK or, um, or somewhere else. But in fact, not at all. It was just a trait from her family. And it had to do with their, their long vocal cords. Julia was a big woman. Uh, she always says she was 6'1", but Julia was in fact 6'3 and a half. And her sister was 6'6". Six, six. I mean, that, this was a big family. Her mother always said, I gave birth to uh, 18 feet of children. But I think her mother... Uh, downplayed that number a bit they, they were it was more like you know 25 feet of children um, so it was it to, do with to have such a, a tall large woman produce such a, a fluty little sound that right. was also a bit different yeah it was and, and it it presented a problem for her when she was on camera because uh, the mic didn't know what to do with her voice and of course the cameraman didn't know what to do with her either because she was so tall that they could never get her in a frame. Uh, so it was always uh, interesting to see what they do with such a large woman. Listeners may know that Meryl Streep played Julia Child on screen. And in a way, Meryl Streep is our, I would not say our equivalent because it's a very different thing. There are other actresses who are very fine, but someone who rises to the occasion to play the head of the Washington Post, the Prime Minister of England, of Britain, um, Julia Child, Meryl Streep tends to get those roles. And well, yeah. The interesting thing, the interesting thing about that is uh, Julia is, the book Deary that I wrote is coming to Broadway next year. Uh, we found out yesterday that they finally have a theater and now they are casting around for iconic actresses to play it. A uh, short list that I cannot share with you at this no. time, but um, it will expand what we know of the Julia character that Meryl Streep played into something quite different. We will not discuss the names, but would the woman hired to play this role, and I assume it's a woman, um, be hired primarily for her voice or her physicality? Her physicality. Okay. Yeah, completely. The voice is is a learned thing, and uh, and that can be taught, but uh, it needs a large woman. Yes. So I I'm going to move incongruously, but I think logically from one American icon to another. Julia Tile, let's move to Bob Dylan. <laughs> because okay. try to draw a line through that. <laughs> but there is quite a line. They are sort of. A category of one, even though many other people did what they did. Bob Dylan, I think it's fair to say, has a very distinct voice mm -hmm. and is known and recognized by the voice and, and opinion is divided on the voice, not what he says, but just the actual voice and the way people respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say that you have drawn portraits of both of these people as American originals. I, I'm just gonna parenthetically say before you reply that Ronald Reagan, the subtitle of his book, of the book he wrote about him is An American Journey. I yeah. think he's a remarkable character like him or not politically, but I'm not sure he's an American original to the degree, and you can disagree with me, that either Julie Child or Bob Dylan was. You wanna talk about that first? I'm happy to Go do ahead. it. Because uh, when, when I set out to write the Reagan story, um, you know, my friends tried to talk me out of it. I am a longtime lefty liberal, uh, did not vote for Ronald Reagan twice. Um, and my Democratic friends um, said that they, uh, I was making the mistake of my life. And my Republican friends, believe it or not, Fred, I have Republican friends, uh, both of my Republican friends <laughs> warned me off of it. Um, what I discovered about Reagan and the reason I chose him as a subject is he's very much like Julia Child and Bob Dylan in the sense that um, uh, 
he was beloved by many people and he changed the culture. And those are the two things I always look for when I'm uh, approaching a subject and whether or not I'll write about them for a biography. They have to have both of those qualities and there are few and far between that fit that category. In Reagan's case, uh, he was a true American original in as much as he came from the Midwest with no credentials whatsoever. And in a very short period of time, he became in this order, one of the great radio broadcasters in the Midwest every night, uh, people in seven states tuned in to listen to him uh, religiously. And he went on from there to become a Hollywood movie star. I mean, really out of nowhere, went to Hollywood and became a star from jumping from his broadcasting days. From there, decided to enter politics and became the governor of California. And in addition to that, the president of the United States. And I thought that was a truly remarkable um, and, and idiosyncratic American story to follow. And um, like many of the subjects that I begin to tackle, uh, who I don't know that much about, came to admire, maybe not for his politics, I wouldn't vote for him, but as uh, someone who really cared and thought that he was bringing something better up to the world that, that, that he could control and, 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 and affect. Uh, well, and so in that respect, yeah. I think Reagan deserves to be up there with Dylan and, and Julia Child as uh, a remarkable American that transformed our culture. Well, since mine is a music program and a lot of it focused on voices, let's stick to voices for a moment. Yeah, let's but, talk about Dylan's voice. <laughs> but I want to talk about Dylan. But the thing is, Dylan, I want you to talk about him. But Reagan had a really good voice. Beautiful. Reagan had a beautiful voice. And he also had excellent diction, not overemphasized diction, but just very natural diction that lent a degree of credibility to what he said that I think many people absorbed, not so much as a movie actor, but I think more as a politician. Yeah, uh, I felt sometimes in his films that he was reciting lines and there was not an emotional connection, whereas either he was the most brilliant actor as a politician or he was coming from a place of conviction and the voice aligned with the words and with the ideas, and with the facial expression. And I mean, I, I remember hearing many speeches and you could hear correctly the commas, the periods, the breaths, the pauses. And among political orators, not the content now, but the actual delivery, he was one of the best. Well, you know, you have to understand that when Ronald Reagan first entered the public space, as a broadcaster, there was no video attached. So it was all in the voice. And Reagan developed that and, and really honed it beautifully at a very early age. Listen, he was only 21 years old when he got his first job as a radio broadcaster. And he worked at that for a, a good six years. So he, he learned the value of, of communicating with people who couldn't see him and they fell in love with that voice. I mean, and he learned how to, uh, to use it in many different circumstances. First, he started out as a sports broadcaster, uh, which meant that he would have to convey the excitement of games that people couldn't see and also that he couldn't see. He actually got uh, telex, uh, little telex strips of what was happening in baseball games. And, and two minutes later, he would have to convey that excitement to his listeners just out of his head, uh, which was really fantastic. And then of course, he learned how to take that voice and expand it with his persona in front of a camera in Hollywood. And so he, he really had that down pat. He knew, how to, he knew how to communicate. And of course he was called the great communicator whether or not he communicated to you or anybody else is one thing, but he, he knew his craft very well. Which makes me think of something that we'll talk about after we talk about Bob Dylan's voice.
that Julia Child, Ronald Reagan, and Bob Dylan, all products of the 20th century, Dylan, I guess, a bit younger, were shaped by and helped shape the technology of their times. Because Julia Child, I'm not just talking about cooking equipment, but live television. Bob Dylan, the electrification of guitars and, and the way music went in that direction. Ronald Reagan, in terms of using telexes to communicate imagery and then to be able to shape imagery very well. Uh, you know, one of his most famous speeches that uh, united the nation, even if we were divided, was when uh, the space shuttle, I believe it was, exploded. The Challenger, and, yes. Yeah, the Challenger. And he very effectively gave a speech that whether you're liberal, conservative, it didn't much matter. He yeah. captured that moment very, very well. I don't know if he wrote that text, probably not, but he recited it beautifully and naturally and with a good degree of genuine emotion and not actor's emotion. Yeah, but no, technology all across the board. That's true. But uh, I, I, I won't take exception with that. I agree with it 100 percent. But I, I also think that all three of these people, uh, Julia Child, Bob Dylan and Ronald Reagan, were shaped most definitely by where they come from. Julia in Pasadena, Dylan in the coal regions, Minnesota, and Ronald Reagan more than anybody from the Midwest. And, and those roots were so strong um, and, and really gave them a sense of not only who they were, but where they came from and the kind of people that they were communicating with. Um, and I think that that was as important to them as, as anything else. Well, with Reagan, specifically Illinois, um, which also gave us Charlton Heston, who started out as liberal and then moved to very conservative. William Holden, who was Reagan's best man at his wedding to Nancy Reagan, who was a Republican of the Illinois variety, which is to say, not the most extreme Republican, but sort of solid Republican, so to speak. Um, John Wayne came from Iowa. It's not to say that all the people came from the Midwest were conservative. They were not at all. No, let were, me just interrupt, but yeah. Fred, and, and say that uh, Ronald Reagan started out as a Roosevelt Democrat. In yes. fact, his father uh, ran the Democratic headquarters in their town. And Reagan, he adored FDR and all of FDR's principles. Uh, even when he became a conservative Republican, FDR remained one of his idols. So it, it's, it's always interesting to see how people make the, uh, the transitions in their lives. And, and yeah. it's, it's one of the, uh, the gifts of being a biographer that lets me experience that in, in detail. Well, then I'm going to go right there. One of my favorite authors in all genres died last year with Jan Morris, who was a travel writer, biographer, and so on. And one of the greatest biographies I ever read of Abraham Lincoln was by Jan Morris. Mm -hmm. And what she did as someone from Wales was travel through Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, the lands where Abraham Lincoln was formed. And one of the things I love in your books is the degree to which place and development are part of the context of who these people became. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the first thing I do when I get a contract to write about somebody is I make a beeline for their hometown. Uh, with Reagan, I went right to his hometown, Dixon, Illinois, and actually a smaller town where he was born and, and his parents moved him from just to get a sense you know, you, you really feel the character of the person. When I wrote about the Beatles, I spent two years in Liverpool. I mean, commuting back and forth. Uh, it's essential. You cannot know who a person is until you know where they come from and what, what those experiences are that they got when they were growing up. And it, it's, it tells you everything about the character. So, Bob, is there a city in the world that you've either spent very little time in or no time in that you really pine to spend a lot of time in? Let's start with the city and then pick your biographical subject. Uh, the city of my biographical subjects? No, I'm yeah. saying that let's start with the place that you personally, as Bob Spitz, have pined to go to. It could be Berlin, it could be Buenos Aires, it could be Tokyo, whatever. 
and then we'll find you a subject based on the city. What, what's the city uh, you scarcely know that you would like to really get to know well? Well, I mean, I know it well, but I'd like to know it even more intimately, and that would be Paris. I mean, okay. you know, I've always, I've always dreamed of living in Paris for a couple of years. Um, I'm getting up there in age, but I still intend to do that. Um, but right now, um, my destination is London because I'm working on another book there. And, and well, we'll get to that in a moment. But who yeah. in Paris would you think to write a biography of or near uh, Paris? I mean, you know, that takes me coming up with a subject for a biography takes me such a long time. But, you know, I, I'd love to write about, uh, you know, Yves Montand or somebody like that who uh, who, who grew up during the war emerged as as a as an influence in their hometown and but i really still try to find people on a much more international scale uh so that a big audience can come to a book that i spend five to eight years on each time so it's in fact difficult. i was going to say Yves monton for you wouldn't be the one i would write because i would write the story of his wife simone signore well, it was one of my true. very, very favorites in all genres. But another one, and the more I think about him and study him, I think he's fascinating, is Charles Aznavour, who had a genuine international audience, even bigger than Yves Montand, true. who Liza Minnelli considers the greatest singer of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and she says was more influenced by, her, by him than even by Judy Garland, her mother. Yeah. And... Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm ready to go to Rome <laughs> and whether it would be Marcello Mastriani or I don't know who, but I think that that would be my aspiration. But um, why have you been in London now since, I mean, I know why, but it's a yeah, topic well, dear to me. Go ahead. You know, I just spent four years on and off there with writing about Led Zeppelin, and now I'm going to be the Rolling Stones biographer. Uh, and that is a massive project. In, in the past, I've written about rock and roll bands that have had 10-year careers. Uh, approaching the Stones, we're talking about 60 years. And so it's, it's a daunting project. It, 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 it's just the obstacles in my path, trying to edit everything down, it's daunting. Um, but that'll take up the next at least five years of my life. Well, a couple of Stones anecdotes. Um, they are my favorite rock band. I think they're among the most operatic, and I think that's part of my appeal. The Who have that too. But when I read Keith Richards' memoir, he referred to Mick Jagger as being a cross between James Brown and Maria Callas. <laughs> um, when I worked at the Metropolitan Opera, I met all kinds of very famous people, Indira Gandhi and Nancy Reagan, actually, and all kinds of figures. And it was great. And they were all fine. And I interacted with them without hesitation. Uh -huh. The one person where I was struck speechless was when I met Mick Jagger, who was attending a performance of Tosca and was referred to me because I was the manager. Mm -hmm. I, I could not get words out. <laughs> and yeah. because I think he's a marvelous performer in thinking about him, I think one thing that's missing in a lot of discussions of him, he's very witty. He is witty. Yes, yeah, a very smart man. Um, he engineered the entire Stone's success yeah. over 60 years. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, invested all their money in, in financially and knew how to handle that aspect of their careers. Um, yeah, he's a brilliant guy. And, and you know, even a caricature of, of himself, um, yes. which makes him interesting on another level. You know, once you understand who you are and you play that personality in public um, and in, even in private, uh, you become someone else, which is really a fascinating aspect of his career. Well, there's a very famous brief clip I'm sure you can find on YouTube if you haven't seen it, and listeners can, of early in their career. The Stones had moderately long hair, not very long hair. Mm 
and they were performing and someone called out to Mick Jagger, why don't you get a haircut? And Jagger immediately replies, what, I look like you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or as George Harrison would have said, I just had one. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, yeah, these, they they came prepared with those those rejoinders. But I also think that Jagger understands greatness in others. He understood that Tina Turner was a greater dancer and learned dancing from Tina Turner. In the famous documentary that Sidney Pollack began and other people completed about Aretha Franklin, where she recorded gospel, Mick Jagger was in the back of the church in Los Angeles, where you are. Mm -hmm. And um, he learned from the greats. And I don't, he learned from Muddy Waters and blues musicians. And James Brown. And James Especially. Brown. And probably Maria Collis, now that I think yeah. about it. Yeah. But all the greats do that, Fred. Uh, all the greats know who to look at and what to take from them. The Beatles were classic with that. You know, McCartney spent all of his spare time going to the theater, listening to uh, classical music, listening to experimental music. Um, I know personally Bruce Springsteen, who I was associated with, did the same thing. Uh, the greats know how to do that. And they know that's what makes them even greater. Um McCartney clearly has a love of classical music and you can hear it in his compositions. Mm -hmm. In dealing, I assume that you've interviewed him at some point. Did he talk about his musical roots? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, his musical roots are very definite. They were uh, R&B, of course. Rhythm and blues. Uh, but but country, and, country and Western, especially the Beatles, the Beatles grew up on country and Western music. Um, there was an American base near where the Beatles um, grew up right after the war. And all the servicemen had records from home and they were all country and Western and they left them in Liverpool. And so all the Liverpool kids, before they heard rock and roll, before they heard Elvis Presley, they heard country, country and Western music. And, and so it's, you hear all the influences uh, you, with people like Dylan, with people like the Beatles. It, it's all there. It sets the table for them. So let's talk now about Bob Dylan's voice and oh, yeah. as a communicative device and the degree to which I'm asking, does he affect it or is it really that voice? Because oh, if you hear a song like Lay, Lady Lay, it's a very different sounding voice than most of his other songs. Yeah, no, it's it's that voice. And, you know, when I was 13 years old and I first heard Bob Dylan, my reaction was like everybody else's. It was, oh, wow, that's that's too, too harsh, too, you know, too weird. But I've come to believe that Bob Dylan, like Rod Stewart and a couple of the other people who have voices that sound like they come through coffee filters, uh, Bob Dylan's voice is one of the great voices of all time. First of all, it's unique. You hear it, you know right away it's Bob Dylan. It is always sung on, on key, perfectly pitched. Um, he knows how to elongate notes. And, and, to, to, and, and I know for a fact that Bruce Springsteen learned everything he learned by listening to Bob Dylan records. Um, singing like that uh, in, in, in what sounds like harsh, harsh tones um, is very difficult. And especially when you sing on key, they have a different kind of melodic quality to them. So I've always said that Dylan's voice, as far as rock and roll goes, to me, it's one of the greatest rock and roll voices of all time. So something that Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, I would say Keith Richard have in common, maybe Mick Jagger too, and certainly John Lennon, is a wonderful gift for the English language, all applied in different ways. Bruce Springsteen's memoir really knocked me back because it was so beautifully written. And it's not that I expected otherwise, but I think of him as a musician who writes very telling lyrics, very accurate lyrics. But the beauty of the writing of that book was something I did not quite expect 
Yeah. And same with Keith Richards. It should come as no surprise because if you have the ability to write great lyrics that are poetic, that uh, in Dylan's case are filled with irony, drama, uh, you know, again, that's a table setter for for writing. And and whether it's in a lyric, uh, a prose, or, or, you know, or prose, it, it's very close. I mean, it, it really is. When I read Bruce's book, I knew exactly what I was going to get before I de delved into it. The guy's eloquent. Uh, Dylan, I mean, Dylan is one of the great poets of all time. Why shouldn't he be a great writer? Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Yeah, that, that was a, I, I mean... <laughs> That was one of the great days of my life, to tell you the truth. <laughs> my wife came into the living room and said, there's some news. Uh, and it's come from the Nobel Committee. You're going to be very happy. And I thought, oh, Philip Roth has finally won the Nobel Prize. Or John O'Hara, people who I've loved, who always wanted it, who never got near it. And she said, this is going to make you even happier. And when she told me it was Bob Dylan, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Uh, that was, I, I had a smile on my face for days. I, I think he deserved it um, and, and brought so much to, to, to writing in a way that the Nobel Committee finally woke up and saw it, which was yeah. great. Yeah, Dylan is, for me, Dylan is like Shakespeare, you know. Um, go back and listen to a couple of songs and say, hey, if you like those, there are the sonnets and the, you know, I mean, there's so much to listen to. There's another figure you've not written about him to my knowledge, but someone that you knew very well. And again, I don't talk about people privately. I'm not interested in that. But as an artist, um, although I think I would like him as a person, Elton John, I'm speaking very specifically, his musical gifts are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I know that he works with mostly Bernie Taupin, Taupin, the lyricist, and they seem to have figured out how to awaken the best in the other. But when I hear Elton John melodies, I know that he studied classical music. He has a very solid classical foundation. Right. Um, would you talk about him as a musician and about a comp as a composer? Well, he's a brilliant musician. I've heard him play classical piano, uh, and, and it's extraordinary. I mean, that's what he grew up on. And look, you know, I mean, it's the foundation for everything. You can't go to rock and roll and be a great rock pianist unless you've studied that instrument. And you, the, the study of the instrument always begins with classical music. Uh, although, of course, he studied, you know, Boogie Woogie and... and but it all stems from learning the classics first. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, he, um, that's where he comes from. And it's allowed him to uh, play music in all genres. You know, he can go from uh, boogie woogie to rock and roll to classical to jazz, which I've heard him play as well. Uh, he's an extraordinary musician. I mean, these guys, all the people we've been talking about, they do not get to where they are today by some, you know, quirk of fate. They've worked hard at it. They've studied hard. And I've found that across the board. You know, Paul McCartney and John Lennon worked every day on their music. They carved out periods of their days where they sat down, shut out the rest of the world and just worked on their music. And, and you know, I mean, that's where greatness comes from. It begins there. I think with that too is a passion. There's oh. an originality, but there's a passion um, that they feel that they have to do it. There, there may not be an alternative. About yeah, Bob Dylan- just tell you, to, to, to expand on that, with Dylan in his case, when he was young, 20 years old, 21, he couldn't control it. It poured out of him, Fred. Um, I, I've talked to people who, somebody told me they walked from Greenwich Village uptown in New York with him and he just kept stopping every few blocks to write lyrics down and to write notes down. He couldn't control himself. 
And I know the same thing was true of uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon. It, it all comes in a burst. And, and um, you know, it's a remarkable thing to experience as a biographer. How many subjects that you've worked on, and I, I don't mean Reagan here because he was not a musician and we're talking, or Julia Child, um, but maybe Julia in a different way, where their passion and their devotion to continuous creation moved on for decades or on the other hand stopped. I mean, there are many people who say that the Rolling Stones didn't create anything much after 1971. Right. I don't agree, but there are many people who say that. And the Who, the same, and there are certain bands that we know of. The Beatles stopped around that time. Right. But um, the bands who continued, a lot of times people said that they were just repeating what they had done and that their yeah. great achievements came in their 20s. Well, I, I think that, you know, there, you have a burst of something as a young person and if you have that gift inside of you, it, it all comes out as quickly as possible. And as I said before, I don't think it's a controllable thing. I think it just bursts out of them and they, and they deal with it. Um, but uh, I do believe that it, it comes to a point where uh, they just start to copy what they've done. And I know in Dylan's case, after about five albums, six albums, he said he tried to parrot himself and it was a disaster. Uh, he, he couldn't do it. He couldn't copy the greatness. Um, the Beatles, after they disbanded and, uh, you know, Paul McCartney did some things with other bands. John had some songs, but they didn't approach anything that was as remarkable as they created when they were younger. I think there's that that gift that if it's inside you, it comes out. And, uh, and after a while, the fountain stops. Uh, and then you become somebody who is still creative, understands your craft, but you're, it's not flowing the way it did before. And you have to find some way to take it and move it in a different direction. And that's also a very fascinating process to watch as, as from a biographer's standpoint. In talking about the people we have been, I would maybe say that Elton John has managed to keep producing good music in way, I know, it, okay. But, but I mean, <laughs> he had so many hits early on, but through the decades, he's produced music that has certainly appealed to people. Absolutely. I don't think people say to him, just play Philadelphia Freedom and your song and that's it. Mm. But yeah, it, it's a look. It's a matter of an opinion. Um, I, well, you could say the things about such as the Lion King. I know, okay. but what I mean is that <laughs> is, is, I'm, I'm going to speak now as a music guy. It's very melodic, and it uh -huh. works as a Broadway musical. Whether we like that or not is a different thing. But the gift of melody, I don't think, has deserted Elton John. Oh, not at all. And and I don't think the gift of melody deserted. Any of the people I've talked about, or whether it's Lennon and McCartney or Dylan or, you know, or, or, or the Led Zeppelin guys who we haven't mentioned, but absolutely, um, you know, they've just, you, they just have to find, uh, the gift of melody hasn't deserted them, but perhaps the gift of originality has. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I find that in Elton John's work, uh, I don't find the originality as strong especially in something like you mentioned The Lion King. Uh, to me, it sounds generic. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Elton's later work, as Dylan's later work, and even Bruce Springsteen's later work, um, becomes a bit generic. They play to their, their audience. You have specialized, despite writing about Reagan and Julia Child, in writing about musicians and about what music not only who these people are but what music is mm -hmm. and you write for an audience that i would imagine is primarily geared toward people who like dylan and the beatles and the rolling stones and led zeppelin and so forth right. um you but what is the art and the challenge of writing about music 
and musicians. There's a diff- I could write about music or I could write about composers. But if I were to unite the composer and the composition, that's a different thing that I don't choose to do much. Yeah, no, I think you one of the, beautifully I, unite the two. I think the gift is really learning how to put it in cultural context. Uh, and that I, I really think a lot about before I even approach a subject. Uh, you know, make it a, a bigger story. Let the reader understand not only what they created, but the life and times that they created it in and how it relates to that audience. And also um, how, it, how it changed them as, as personalities. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger job. The cultural context, I think is really what distinguishes a good book about a musical personality than anything else. Uh, in, in the case of Led Zeppelin that I've just written about, I began with a study of blues and the great blues figures uh, like John Lee Hooker and T-Bone Walker and uh, Albert Ammons uh, and, and Robert Johnson, because that's where it all evolved from. And you couldn't understand what a band like Led Zeppelin became and, and how they, the music evolved before you understood where it came from. And, and also the fact that these were post-war English kids uh, without any prayer in the world of, of having any kind of careers at the time and how that evolved and how it, it grew up and around them so that you understand where these, where these people are, are placed in their own world. And, and so that I think is what distinguishes uh, what I write from what other people write. So let's go to Led Zeppelin. It's a band for which I don't have any feeling. That's not a I negative understand. judgment. I have no feeling for them at all. And you shouldn't have. And I'll tell you why, Fred. Okay. Because your interest in pop and rock and roll was the same as mine. We're children of the 60s. And so uh, we grew up on the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Chuck Berry and uh, The Who and... And, and Janis Joplin in my case. And, and in, evolved into Crosby, Stills and Nash, Joni Mitchell, James Taylor. And then at the end of the 60s, Led Zeppelin appears. Now, I didn't understand them at all. I never listened to them. I have 20,000 vinyl albums in my collection. I don't have a single Led Zeppelin album. And when my publisher approached me about writing their biography, uh, I couldn't name, I could name maybe uh, Stairway to Heaven, you know, uh, that's about it. Um, so the thing is that rock and roll has very short generational spans. Our span was over in 1969, it ended. A completely different generation approached Led Zeppelin in 1970. Should we have understood it? No, because every new generation of rock and roll has to leave the older generation behind. Rock and roll is an aggressive music that reflects the times of the kids that are listening to it. And when I say kids, I'm talking about 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, the same way that we were that age when we listened to Elvis Presley and people like that. And so I left my parents in the dust who listened to Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra. Led Zeppelin left our generation in the dust. And by 1977, when The Clash put out London Calling, they left all of Led Zeppelin's generation in the dust as well. And so that's what, what, that's what is so unique about rock and roll and the generations. The generational span is much shorter. And should we love that kind of music? No, we shouldn't love that kind of music. Uh, my daughter loves hip hop. She's, you know, 28 years old. This is what she's listening to. I think it's, I hate hip hop and I should hate it. It should, it should leave me in the dust like my music left my parents in the dust. 
And I think that's what's great about it. Well, my dad, who was a musician, played classical and jazz and pop, not and Broadway musicals, not rock. Always quoted Duke Ellington, who was a patron saint in our house, that there are only two types of music, good music and the other kind. So that I was raised on Black artists from the 20s and 30s, on Fats Waller. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald was the gold standard. There were many, many other singers in all genres, Black and white and other, who we listened to without prejudice, I will say, as musicians and as artists. And so that Woody Guthrie had a place in our household and Paul Robeson and all of these musicians, plus Stravinsky and Mahler and Leonard Bernstein, who was a, a cultural figure in addition to being a musician. Mm -hmm. But I would say that there have been figures in the more recent era who represent that same ideal. One of them would be Bruce Springsteen, but another one even more would be Prince. And Taylor Swift. And Taylor you know, Swift, it, whose work I don't know enough, regard. Right. but I you, see what you're saying. But yeah. Prince, I, I listened to him somewhat in his time, but there were so many different forms of music that he produced that referenced, that's not enough to say sampled a reference, but that acknowledged and incorporated just the way Beethoven acknowledged and incorporated and just the way now there's an artist in America, I don't know how well he is known abroad, named John Baptiste, who has a solid Juilliard classical foundation, mm -hmm. but is a superb jazz musician, but can work in Bach in, in a chord progression when he's playing jazz. Now, you know, the guys from Led Zeppelin could do the same thing. Uh, and the reason they could do that is what, because they were all superb musicians. They had all learned their craft. Uh, John Paul Jones, who was the bass player in the band, uh, his parents were musicians and were very popular musicians in the UK. Uh, Jimmy Page learned first classical guitar and what to do with the guitar and became uh, a guitar mu magician in his own respect. John Bonham, the, uh, the drummer, learned how to play triplets with his feet by watching Gene Krupa. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, 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 for a guy like me who rejected Led Zeppelin when they came out, and I rejected them because I was on the road with Bruce Springsteen and we just didn't cross paths. I didn't understand that music. To be able to sit and listen objectively to what they were doing as musicians gave me an appreciation for their music that I never thought that I would have. And, and I have it in spades, which is, is, is good. Uh, you know, you can dismiss them as a heavy metal band, as a progressive band, uh, but what they were doing was playing music <laughs> in, 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 in a very high um, achieves place. And, and so, when I learned about them and listened to them in that respect, I came up with a whole new admiration for them. I realized that the musicians that you've written about have all been male. Is there a female musician? You wrote about Julia Child, but she was not a musician. Is there a female musician or group that you could imagine sinking your teeth and your talents into for three or four years? Oh, no doubt. I mean, Joni Mitchell, to me, is one of the great artists of all time. I would bend over backwards. Uh, and, and Graham Nash, whose book I um, ghost wrote, and is a buddy of mine, um, of course, is still friendly with Joni. And that's on my bucket list. Yeah, I would love to do that. I, I find her one of the, not one of the great, just one of the great uh, music uh, artists of all time, but a poet extraordinaire and a guitar player extraordinaire as well. So uh, yeah, I would love to do that, absolutely. And you know, also, I mean, look, I don't think Aretha was treated well in any, in any book yet. And for me, uh, the story about Aretha is, you know, the transition of, of, of black to pop R&B uh, 
in in my lifetime, and and it would have to you know start in in Chicago or or Detroit, and and there is cultural context extraordinaire in, in those stories. So uh, I'd love to do that. Sure, yeah, no, it's just a. Um, it, it's, it, I guess it's, you know, having written only about men, except for Julia, uh, I would welcome the chance to, uh, to really study a, 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 an extraordinary female artist. There's a term that I use about myself, and I mean it sincerely, I, I'm not super proficient the way you are in that field of music, with the exception of Aretha, who I refer to myself as an Aretha-ologist, and have loved her and been inspired by her work and her contradictions for a very long time. And mm -hmm. so much of what we know about her through her own limited pronouncements, through books that she began, through that wonderful documentary that she tried to block of her gospel recording in 1972 in LA, um, of the parentage of her first two sons, all of that, I don't really care all that much about that because she began a book that ultimately she didn't much care for called From These Roots. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest sections I've read in any book by any author are the early chapters in that book. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, yes, she wrote about her roots as a woman born in Tennessee, raised in Detroit with a powerful preacher father and a mother who died when she was young. And the presence in her home of Clara Ward, the great gospel singer, and Mahalia Jackson, Martin Luther King, and so forth. But what Aretha wrote about in that book is from these roots, her musical foundations. Yeah. And I've never found anyone who better expressed her musical formation than Aretha herself. Yeah, the later chapters of the book, unfortunately, was some score settling that didn't help the book. Yeah. But the no, I'd, I'd love to take a crack at it. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I think she's a fascinating individual over and above the music that she gave us. And, and I have a hand in, in, uh, you know, in a lot of her story because uh, she was discovered more or less by John Hammond Sr., who was yes. my mentor mm -hmm. uh, at, during the Springsteen days. And also I knew him quite well and, and sat in his office just talking about him and myself often. And also Jerry Wexler, mm -hmm. who was Aretha's subsequent producer, who I knew very well as well. Uh, and so I would love a crack at that. And uh, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> and I, I describe her the way I described Ella Fitzgerald. To me, the greatest American singer, perhaps musician was Ella Fitzgerald. Aretha second, but a very close second, because Ella Fitzgerald could in her head hear an orchestra the way Mozart did and go where we think she's supposed to go and then turn. And that sounds strange. And But just like Mozart, of course, he was right. And with the case of Ella Fitzgerald, of course, she was right. What Aretha had was not the orchestra in her head. Maybe she did. She had it in her hands and her piano playing was the communication of that which she was not singing right oh absolutely yeah absolutely and and she had a gift in those hands that i don't know if we've heard since no no one i can think of maybe yeah. prince but that would be about it yeah so mr spitz yeah um at the beginning of our conversation i mentioned what my favorite book of yours is uh -huh. the saucier's apprentice Yes. Now, not because there's a musical reference to Paul Ducat there, but because the biographer wrote about himself. But it was not an autobiographer in this case. It was something else. It was a phase of your life. It was about change. I don't want to describe it further. But if you apply these principles of going to the places and finding the roots of these people you write about, what was your approach as the writer of The Sauc Saucier's Apprentice and what's the title about? Yeah, I, um, I, it's funny. I was at a transition in my life when I decided to write that book. I had um, lived in New York, a city I loved that I was no longer in. Uh, 
I had worked on the biography of the Beatles for eight and a half years uh, during tumultuous times in which um, I was divorced. I hit 50 as an age, uh, left New York and wound up the single father of an 11 year old daughter. Um, and so after all of those things, I did what anybody in that situation would do. I ran away to Europe for three months to learn how to cook. Uh, but really it was well, a Bob, book about- you did that before other people did that, frankly. I did. It's trendy more recently, but you really did it much sooner. I remember the time. Right. I had, uh, there, there, there wasn't anything that uh, I had that allowed me to see someone else doing that before, uh, except maybe George Plimpton. Yes. Uh, and, and so um, I, I did that. And I, um, uh, it was really, uh, self, it wasn't just learning how to cook. That was a metaphor for self-discovery. I wanted to figure out who I was at the age of 50, where I had come from, and who I wanted to become after that. And, and I'll tell you a, a secret that I don't normally talk about. I actually wrote another book during that time that was not published. And that was at the age of 51, 52, I wrote a book about trying to become a rock star at that age. <laughs> uh, and so for a year, I spent um, writing songs, putting a band together. Uh, I got a record deal at RCA. Yeah. Uh, I submitted a tape um, and decided at the end of that book not to write about it. It was too um, transformative, uh, too much of a self-discovery, parts of myself that I didn't want to share with people. Uh, and writing about the, uh, the discovery of cooking and who I was, was painful enough. In fact, it's a book I've told my daughter, I hope she doesn't read. Mm. Uh, because Ever little... or when maybe she's much older? Mm, I'd rather she didn't. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's for her to decide. Yeah. Um, writing about yourself is a very painful thing. Uh, if you're honest, uh, and if you want to make an arc in your life and examine where that arc takes you. A and um, I wasn't so sure I was happy where it was taking me. So um, it, it was instructive. Uh, I certainly enjoyed learning how to cook. Uh, I enjoyed being in France and Italy for three months, studying with the greatest of chefs. They were very... Uh, very nice to me, very kind to me. Um, but there was a lot in that book that um, I don't think people should read about me. <laughs> and, and so um, discover it on your, on your own. <laughs> yes, I recommend it because I found it very honest. Mm -hmm. And I knew the guy who wrote it, but the, I didn't know everything about you that I then found in the book. And but it, it was all consistent and congruent with the person that I did know. Uh -huh. and therefore, yeah. I didn't feel that you were creating a persona for the reader that was different from the person that you are. Well, and I think it would be only fair to tell your listeners, Fred, that at the end of that discovery of mine and writing that book, I had turned myself kind of inside out. Uh, and had a clear picture of where I wanted to go after that. And almost simultaneously, you introduced me to a woman who became my wife. Yes. And I was In ready other words, for it. She was the wife, or I felt, and we're speaking personally here, but in front of an audience, I too felt that you were ready for it. And in part, it was reading that book that made me feel that. And the person that I introduced you to is deeply special to me. And I wouldn't have presented her to just anyone. And she, by the way, is the person who alerted you to Bob Dylan's Nobel Prize, not your first wife. Um, and yes, I'm glad it worked out. I had a feeling it would. But I will say to you now, we've never said this. It was reading that book that made me think that this was a possibility. <laughs> 
Well, and it's sitting here talking to you. Uh, it's the first time I've really thought that writing that book make me made me ready for the next stage of my life. Uh, so yeah, so there we have now shared it with the rest of everyone. The world. So yeah. I'm going to ask your advice and opinion because I, as you now know, I love that book of yours. I love many of them, but that one different because I knew the guy personally. I knew Julia somewhat, but uh, and I was speechless before Mick Jagger, but otherwise I have not come across the figure. I knew Nancy Reagan, but otherwise I've not known the figures personally that you've written about. And I have been asked since my thirties actually by publishers to write either a memoir or a book about my life experience and the people I've known and so on. And I haven't wanted to for any number of reasons. One was the things that I may know about public figures that might be salacious, I have no desire to recount. Whereas the things that I know about these same people that I greatly admire, mm -hmm. I would like to recount, but that doesn't always seem to be sought after. Um, I worked on a, as an advisor on a documentary about Luciano Pavarotti, who was a great friend of mine for 29 years. And I was able, Ron Howard directed, I was able to bring something to that work that I think they benefited from. And Luciano's public image, not perfect, no one is perfect, um, became clearer. Uh, but I have no desire really to write about these people except for how they impacted me. But Secondly, I haven't had a great desire to write about myself, primarily because the work I do, I think, is about my, not about myself, but it's from myself. So in talking to you, or let's say, talking to Thomas Hampson, who I did recently, or Frederica Bonstata, these are all people who inspire me, you too, but I come out in the sense that you, each one of you that I speak to brings out something else in me. And I may be pretty good at asking the right questions and knowing how to connect things, but I'm not ready. I don't, I mean, in one way I am because, you know, you and I are more or less contemporary or a little older, but I, you know, if I'm to write such a book, maybe I should be writing it. But I think that if I do, it would condition people's perception of my work, not positively or negatively, but if I describe life circumstances, I think that that would color the way people see my work. And I'd rather my work just be the work. See, one of the things that, that I think you, you'll come to understand is that if you have to think whether or not you're ready to write a book like that, you're not ready. Uh, you write a personal book when you can no longer resist, when it is absolutely necessary, it's coming out of you, you can't stop it. And that's what happened with me in The Saucier's Apprentice. Uh, it started out as a perspective adventure, but it didn't end that way. It ended because I realized at a certain point, I needed to get something out of me and to write about it and to, uh, and to share it. Uh, and at the end of that, if it wasn't right, I was gonna put it in a drawer and not let anybody see it, which is what I did with the rock and roll book that I wrote about. Um, and, and so I, I think you can't force that kind of a book and, and it, you can't, it can't be contrived. It has to be something that is, is just organic. And you'll know that when the time's right. I know that in this subject, I was greatly influenced by someone I knew that sounds like name dropping, but I actually knew her for decades with Jacqueline Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, who I met when I was a boy of about nine and knew her into my young adulthood when I worked at the Metropolitan Opera and she was chair of American Ballet Theater. And then when she became a book editor, I knew her in that context. And she was very clear about the fact that she never wanted to write a memoir or she didn't particularly like having books written about her mm -hmm. because she sort of felt that her actions and her whatever public pronouncements she made were sufficient to define her. Mm 
and that no one else could quite understand and that she had no Im impetus to want her to find herself. Very few uh, people who are, are um, international figures want to have a book written about them uh, because they, you know, they, they live in a, in a bubble and they don't necessarily want to know how people perceive them. They're happy to, to do their work and, and, and give what they have of themselves, but don't want to be analyzed, especially by somebody they don't know. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm aware that um, some of my subjects would not have wanted me to write about them. I know um, in the case of the Beatles, Paul McCartney urged me to write about them. That was one thing, to set the story straight. But Dylan came to it very reluctantly, very reluctantly. Uh, Julia had, before she died, urged me to write her biography, sent me letters about doing such a thing. But I, I know the, the guys from Led Zeppelin were not happy about it. They didn't want to have the microscope on them. And, and uh, you know, you can't blame a person. But the, the flip side of that is when, when you put yourself in the public spotlight, you're opening up yourself to, uh, to analysis. And, and that's just part of the game. And, and so, uh, you know, that's what happens. But there are many biographies by biographers that are frankly very trashy and aim for the dirt and aim with who slept with whom and don't necessarily try to explain a life. And your books are different in that I felt that I always came to know the people better, even if they were musicians I liked or chefs that I knew somewhat, mm -hmm. um, or in the case of your own memoir. And is that learned? Where did you learn to write biographies? How did that happen? Well, listen, I, I, let me just address what you said. And that is that um, you have to have respect for your subject. Uh, and, and that's what, what differentiates a trashy book from a non-trashy book. Look, one of my mentors was a, a wonderful man named Albert Goldman. Um, Albert wrote a book about John Lennon that was vilified. And I happened to have known that before Albert died, uh, he had no respect for John Lennon when he started the book. And it was apparent on the very first page, you can't make that kind of mistake. You're either one kind of a writer or another kind of a writer. Uh, and I made my decision at the very beginning of my career as a writer that I was going to respect the people I wrote about or not write about them. That, you know, look, Led Zeppelin, I didn't know anything about their music. I didn't particularly like their music, but I respected the fact that this was a band that sold more records than anybody but the Beatles. And so I knew there was a story there that would draw out something much more important than my not understanding their music. And, and I was right. I was right. It was all there. But it came from approaching my subject out of respect and not of saying, hey, look, I'm going to expose the fact that um, they, were, they had bad behavior on the road, which everybody knew about. I tried to find something deeper, something that explained who they were as musicians, where they came from, what they became, and why they became that. And that's what I think separates my books from a lot of other books about pop, pop stars, pop figures. We've mentioned a few musicians who wrote books about themselves, Bruce Springsteen, um, Aretha Keith Franklin, Richards. Keith Richards. Yeah. Are there other books by musicians, whether classical, popular, jazz, whatever, about themselves or by themselves that you would hold up as a good book worth reading? You know, off the top of my head, I, I can't suggest, but I'm sure there are. Look, I think that any book written by a performer uh, or an artist about their craft tells us something about them that we're not going to get from another book. You know, it's something that they decide they've, they've got to share with you. And I, I find that remarkable. 
At the same time, because people have said to me, Keith Richards wrote such a great book. Why would you write a book about the Rolling Stones right now? Because that's his view. And, and it's, it's very subjective uh, and it's very narrow. He was there and he lived it. But all the other people who were associated with that band uh, see it in a different light and can bring much more to the story and tell you much more about why something happens than somebody who lives in the bubble of their own fame. Uh, but to answer your question, I think that anybody who writes their own book, any artist that writes their own book, conveys something about themselves that is really worth reading and exploring. I think a difference between the two of us as creative people or people with our interests is that my interests tend to lie in more in the distant past. And if I ever were to write biographies or let's call them scholarly books about people, it would be people from the past, quite far in the past. Mm -hmm. Whereas you've written about people who have overlapped your lifespan. True. Have um, you ever thought well, about writing someone about someone further back or would that not be interesting because they're not people you can talk to to do the reporting on the book? No, no, not at all. I mean, look, I, I'd love to write a, a biography of John Hammond Sr. Um, uh, I am definitely uh, going to write a book about George Steinbrenner. Um, Tell for people who don't know who that character was. <laughs> well, he's a man who not only, like Julia Child, he not only owned the New York Yankees, but Baseball. he but he transformed the way the game is played. And that brings me back to what we started talking about at the beginning, Fred. And that's when you look for a subject, it has to be placed in cultural context uh, and bring something much more. So if I were writing about John Hammond, I would write about, uh, he, he was a Whitney, one of the great New York families. And he, I would go back and look at their history. I would look at the fact that he went to Harlem when no white boys were going to Harlem and discovered Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday before he discovered Aretha and Bob Dylan and Paul Simon and, and, and Bruce Springsteen and, and Benny Goodman, who was his brother-in-law. I mean, you know- oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's all cultural context. Yes, mm -hmm. he was married to the woman who was a Sarnoff, who was the head of RCA. RCA. Yeah. So, you know, it, again, it's all about- One of whom was married to the opera singer Anna Moffo. Mm-hmm. So it, again, it's, it's all about the bigger story, not just the narrow focus of who this person is, but what made them, where they come from, putting them in their own cultural context. It's all what makes a great biography. So final question, because you and I could talk a great length, but um, we do want to conclude. You're from Pennsylvania. Is there any figure from the state of Pennsylvania, which is one of the most interesting and contradictory states in, in our great country in that it has produced James Stewart, Benjamin Franklin, Renee Fleming, all kinds of people. Betsy in all, Ross. Betsy <laughs> Ross, you're right, actually, Betsy Ross, um, who really changed the world, not just the United States, but really changed the world. Ooh. And when I was growing up in New York City, in our sixth grade classes, we had to study New York history. It was required that we study New York history. And I don't know if other states, maybe Texas does this, has a requirement that you study state history. Mm -hmm. But Pennsylvania, and I have family and friends there, is such a strange place, but in a very good way, that Philadelphia has produced phenomenal Black musicians, it has been a cradle, not just of, of democracy, but of music in the extreme. The Philadelphia Orchestra has its own collection of instruments from the Wanamaker department store. Central Pennsylvania is uh, Civil War sites. It is um, the Pennsylvania Dutch, the Amish people. 
I've never been to Pittsburgh, but I can't define Pittsburgh, but Carnegie, as in Andrew Carnegie, as in Carnegie Hall, as in funding authors, as in all kinds of things, was Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is industry, but it's also medicine, high art. A few years ago, it was defined as the city per capita with the best artistic, meaning cultural offerings in America, and not New York, not LA, but mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Uh, it has very famous hospitals. There's so much in your state, and I'm wondering the degree to which, because we're talking about roots, these are your roots. Well, let's not forget one of my cultural heroes who, who actually transformed my life because as a young boy uh, growing up in Pennsylvania, when television was first starting uh, and I was preschool, my mother would put me in front of the TV in the afternoon and from two o'clock to five o'clock every day, I watched Dick Clark uh, on America on Bandstand. You're and right. He was a Pennsylvanian. He was a Pennsylvanian who completely changed my life because it gave me a musical reference that I never had growing up and that I can say I drew on for the rest of my life. And for so our international audience, would you talk about Dick Clark, but also his role in racial integration or at least awareness of people yeah. from other backgrounds? Yeah. Sure. Dick Clark, Dick Clark was a disc, we'd call him a disc jockey, but more than that, Dick Clark brought rock and roll to Americans by putting it on television. Uh, and when I was growing up, it was a very localized show. So it ran for three hours every day. They just wanted to fill up time. So he had kids dancing and he would play records and you'd, he'd talk about the music. But those kids dancing were, were integrated. And you never saw that on TV. It outraged people that black kids and white kids would be dancing on the same floor often together. Uh, and so we're talking the early 1960s. Oh, early 19, it's 1950s, my friend. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> we, go, we go back to the 50s on this one. And I'm talking about um, 54, 55, 56, 57. I wasn't uh, around, yeah. In 58, Dick Clark goes national in the United States. Uh -huh. His local show called Bandstand becomes American Bandstand. And he takes integration, the integrated kids, and rock and roll to the entire American public. And so this is a guy who um, was a hero of mine growing up. And I can say that he gave me my first job as a writer because um, as I trans transitioned from being a rock and roll manager, I was looking for a way to get my foot in the door to write. And I called the New York Times to review Dick Clark's memoir mm. uh, and they assigned it to me. And so that was my first job as a writer. And I must say that uh, Dick himself was very generous to me after that. Some other time, I, not here, I will tell you the one time that I met Dick Clark. Okay. But it was an entirely <laughs> other setting. Having nothing for us to, do, to talk about in the future. Had nothing to do with music. Yeah. Bob Spitz, um, Thank you, my friend. I say that as your friend. But also, I do want listeners to know about your books, uh, which I've mentioned, because reading about music and writing about music is very particular. And I think you do it among the best of anyone I've ever read and not because you're my Thank friend. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate it. It that. just happens to be that I can, I didn't know much about Bob Dylan until I read your book. And that's before I knew you actually, mm -hmm. but um, I read the book and I became more interested and cared more about Bob Dylan. It's not that I didn't care. It just, I was focused elsewhere in my musical pursuits, mm -hmm. but it made me care. And your books make people care about subjects they may not have ever encountered. And now I want to read a book by you about Dick Clark. <laughs> uh, okay. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Don't hold my breath. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bob, thank you so much. My best to you and your fantastic wife, who we love. Mm -hmm. And I hope to see you 
when this pandemic eases or we can travel or whatever. But in the meantime, I can't wait to read your biography of the Rolling Stones. Does it have a title? Uh, the Rolling Stones, a biography. <laughs> okay, that, that works. That's truth in advertising. Always great to see you, Fred. Always great Likewise, to see Bob. You. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.